Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. The bear and the dragon, Russia and China are moving closer together as Moscow becomes more and more disenchanted with the West. Can these two countries successfully challenge Western hegemony? Can the bear and dragon reshape the world? To Crosstalk Russia and China, I'm joined by my guest Martin Henneke in Hong Kong. He is chief economist at the Henley Group. And in London, we cross the Pepe Escobar. He is a Asia Times roving correspondent. All right, gentlemen, Crosstalk rules. In fact, that means you can jump in any time you want. Uh, Pepe, if I can go to you in, in London first. Uh, I think most people would agree the 20th century was the American century. Uh, this century, who's it going to belong to? China, maybe China and Russia? What's your crystal ball say? No crystal balls. The 21st is going to be an Asian century, center on China, including Russia, of course, because Russia is also an Asian power. Uh, the Eurasian century, in fact. Uh, this, is, this operates in many levels nowadays. Uh, through the BRICS, of course, two of these very important, Russia and China, uh, and now getting a closer relationship with India inside the BRICS as well. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, they're going to have a summit soon, this month, where they're going to accept new candidates as well. And it's a counterpart to the warmongering NATO in the West. Uh, inside the G20, where Russia and China and the BRICS are very important players, and the Global South, uh, the non-aligned movement, over 120 countries, they watching this very, very carefully. The bottom line is, you know, for in initiating our discussion, the whole developing world, the whole global south is fed up with the current international disorder, in fact. And they are betting that Russia and China are striving towards a multipolar world united with many top uh, developing countries inside the BRICS and outside of the BRICS as well. So this is the beginning of a long road and it has already started. So no wonder the Western Atlanticist elites are panicking big, okay. big time. Okay, Martin, in, in, in Hong Kong, is this a good bet? I mean, what we just heard from Pepe here, the world is looking to uh, China and Russia to develop a, a very strong relationship to essentially push back the West. Well, yes, I largely agree with the points just made. I mean, we, we are investment advisors, though we always see it a bit more, you know, the whole thing from the investor's angle. And one thing we are very concerned about is now the, uh, what's happening with Europe, because all through this supposed recovery that we have seen, whereas equity markets have been going up over the last um, couple of years, and similar in the U.S., the sovereign debt issue hasn't gone away that we have been warning about um, for quite some time. In fact, You've just seen France announcing the can't meet their budget deficit target. They're going to post 4.4 percent budget deficit or higher. Italy is back in recession and the sovereign debt has gone up, even though the interest years or the years on those sovereign bonds are at a record low. So they hardly have to pay any interest on the debt, but still they can't keep the debt under control. And now with the sanctions uh, on Russia, that's not going to help at all either. So as a result of those recent developments, we would say maybe a good idea is uh, to sell Europe and buy China, because China is going to profit from that. That, um, you know, more business coming from Russia and to some extent also uh, other countries. And by the way, from, from an equities investor's perspective, the Chinese market and also the Russian market are actually the best values, yeah. uh, val valued equity markets right now in the world. You know, Pepe, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking back maybe like 15 years now, and, and Russia was just begging, begging to be part of the Western club. You know, Yeltsin, you know, gave away almost, you know, the, 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 whole, uh, the whole kitchen and, and, and the sink to throw, thrown in with it. And, you know, and then, you know, Mr. Putin comes to power, and he's saying, you know, I want to be part of the Western club, too. And then he just became very disillusioned because the doors kept slamming on Russia. Now we have the Ukraine crisis here. I mean, the Chinese must be saying this is a gift from God. Oh, yes. For China, it's been well, a gift well, from God. Like... And especially after... <laughs> okay, go ahead, Pepe. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and Martin will, will, will slip in. Um, after 9-11, that was a gift from God, in fact, from Allah, from uh, Mohammed Atta, or whatever you want to <laughs> call it, for China. Because the U.S. took the eye off the ball and the ball don't you we cannot forget that when the bush team came to power in early 2001 they were trying to organize their foreign policy okay who's our enemy 
and the enemy was China, of course, but obviously they could simply not organize a strategy against China. So a few months later, exactly, by the way, 13 years ago, we had 9-11, and then they con started concentrating on the Middle East and Southwest Asia. Meanwhile, China was doing deals like crazy in Latin America, in uh, uh, Central Asia, in the Middle East, in South Asia. You know, started th the beginning of the, the new Silk Roads that we're talking about nowadays, they started the building blocks for the new Silk Roads. In the beginning of the, of the 2000s, in fact, uh, that was uh, when their com the official campaign, Go West in China, it really took off completely. And they went west, and they went to Europe, they went to Africa, they went to Latin America. So when the Bush uh, team woke up to what the Chinese, how the Chinese were spreading their economic tentacles all over the world, their response was AFRICOM which is a militarized strategy in Africa. In Latin America, they had nothing because the Chinese had already struck excellent deals with Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, basically buying their commodities and exporting Chinese manufactured products. In Africa, they had struck deals with at least 35, 36 African nations. In Central Asia, they were starting to discuss with many countries, including Turkmenistan, how to build pipeline, gas pipelines to China, and in fact, they ended up building and striking a deal with Turkmenistan. And the Americas, by the way, they had nothing apart from a, a <laughs> war on terror. And later on, when Hillary started talking about a new Silk Road, that was just a pipe dream, literally. Because, you know, you cannot build a Silk Road, American style, based in Afghanistan. All right, so let, me, let me go to Hong Kong here. Country. Let me go to Martin here. There's lots, lots of chew on there, Pepe. There. It, it, Martin, you know, it, it, it's absolutely true. You know, I mean, the, after 9-11, the Americans had the war on terror. Uh, they went and uh, destroyed quite a few countries in the Middle East. All the while, China is building its trade relations around the world. And now we get to the point where um, uh, the Europeans have alienated the Russians so much that the Russians will turn around and, and you know, the, the, the deal of the century, maybe of, you know, the millennium uh, deal between Russia and China for energy was struck in a few months ago. Um, and there, these two countries now are, are attached at the hip for decades. I guess Washington and Brussels have really must be satisfied with themselves. Yeah, I mean, what you, what you say is right. O originally, uh, Russia has always been seeking, first of all, the closer relationship with Europe and then to be part of that club, particularly Germany. I mean, the Russians really like the German technology, the German products. Uh, e even the food products, I mean, you know, it might not seem significant, but now after the sanctions are implemented, I think Europe sees that this is really quite a significant part of uh, the exports and, uh, and it does affect them. But then since, since uh, that time, since Putin came to power, a uh, few things have changed. So, the, you know, the, the Europeans haven't really uh, come back the same way to the Russians as Russia has tried to develop the, the, the ties. And then China has been just um, leaping in terms of economic growth. And now, as you may know, uh, as of this year, um, China is set by the International Comparison Program statistics together with the World Bank. They released this um, purchasing power parity adjusted statistics by which China has already become the largest economy in the world. And they are the largest energy uh, consumer already for some time. Now they have become, uh, as of this year, the largest importer of oil from Russia. They may also soon after that 400 billion deal was signed become the largest importer of natural gas. And there you go, more and more developments are happening um, with China, there's also potential um, to perhaps uh, have closer uh, integration with uh, Japan or more exports to Japan and South Korea uh, potentially as well, although they are not yet as close as Russia will be towards China. But yeah, to some extent, certainly also a blessing in disguise in terms of um, allowing Russia, where, which has found it quite convenient just to deal with Europe and just raise finances in Europe, etc., now to deal with a quite a different type of um, culture. Uh, in China, but certainly China is financially so strong um, that Russia shouldn't find it very, very difficult to um, shift some of the fundraising um, to Asia and, and, of course, uh, a lot of their trade and sales as well. It's, it's very interesting, and that's probably exactly what they'll do in this sanctioned environment here. And Pepe, but on the other side here, uh, the European Union gets half of Ukraine and gets to bail it out. You know, I, I think the Chinese, again, really must be kind of uh, laughing out their sleeve. I mean, the, the, it, not only is the European economy very fragile, now they're in a position where um, they're going to lose any kind of chance of getting out of a, at least a light recession over the next few quarters. Look, I've been roving around Europe for over two weeks now, 
And I've been listening to horror stories from all quarters in, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, in uh, Rotterdam, Brussels, Paris, uh, northern Italy, now in London. So Europe, essentially, you know, the bot absolute bottom line. Third recession in five years. There'll be another recession next year. There'll be another recession 2015, 2016. This is a structural problem because it's the austerity policy, essentially. And our friends at the European Central Bank and in Frankfurt and, in fact, in, uh, you know, the, the, the deciding classes, let's put it this way, in Germany, they are telling us, look, this is our policy. We're not going to change. And it applies to the whole of Europe, in fact. What the German business classes want, and Angela Merkel is very much aware of that, although she's always wavering, is privileged relationship, trade, economic, with both mm -hmm. Russia and China. Yep. What does that imply? This implies trade, economic integration of Eurasia. Okay, especially. hang on, Pepe. And We're going to have to go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Russia and China. Stay with RT. Okay, Martin, I'd like to go back to you in Hong Kong. Uh, because of this crisis in, in Ukraine, um, uh, as I said in the introduction of the program, is that uh, Moscow is getting more and more disenchanted with the West, particularly uh, what's going on in Washington. And it's hurt its relationship with, uh, with Europe, uh, trade-wise. I mean, how is the West going to react to this? Because uh, Russia does have options. It is turning, and there's m m m ample evidence that Russia is turning east, particularly to China. I mean, how is the West going to respond to this? Because they like their, their hegemony, they like their dominance, but Russia and China together can be a real magnet. Other countries, as Pepe pointed out, will be uh, pulled towards this um, uh, alliance, if we can call it that. Yes, probably, and I don't really know how Europe will react to that, that, that Russia is moving east. It seems right now Europe is not really uh, acting very much in its own interest. It's quite easy for the U.S. to push for sanctions because they haven't really got very close uh, trade ties with Russia, but for Europe it's really uh, hurting themselves to a large extent. I would hope that um, perhaps if that uh, re most recent ceasefire holds that um, you know things things improve and uh, there's a de-escalation also in terms of the sanctions war but uh, it remains to be seen certainly I'm quite worried about what's going to happen to Europe because they're already struggling this very very high sovereign debt just to tell you some numbers I mean uh, the average European sovereign debt is about 100 percent and Russia's sovereign debt is about 15 percent so much lower and similar to China I mean the financial numbers are actually much better so you know one might just uh, be worried a bit more in Europe, they trade at three times the valuation also of, of um, Russia and more than double the valuation of China. But one thing I do also want to point out in terms of Russia looking to China, to some people it seems like um, it's, it's a one-way relationship that Russia is just desperate to looking for another partner. But in terms of the energy, what's also very important to know is that China has, get a mass, uh, has got a massive, massive pollution problem at its hands because it mostly relies on coal burning, and that's very polluting, which is why you see all these pictures in Beijing of the smog, and um, that's really something the government is trying hard to address. And one way to do that is through cleaner burning yeah. fuel, and that can be done through uh, natural gas. In fact, there was a report, an interesting report released by Greenpeace addressed to the uh, uh, Chinese government released in September 2013 and it's called China Clean Air Plan uh, to Slow Coal Consumption and it says there in the report the main focus of the plan is on increasing the use of natural gas because the solar energy, wind energy etc. It's nice, even they admit that, but it's not nearly enough. But natural gas is going to be uh, available uh, in, in reasonable volume so to, to really be able to make a big difference. So that's one area where China definitely you know, uh, uh, needs Russia absolutely. So it's not just a one-way right. junior-senior partner relationship. And also one last interesting thing uh, that many people aren't aware of. I, I read an interesting poll from Pew Research Center uh, the other day, just released in July. And basically, it talks about the changing uh, image of Russia in the world mm -hmm. after the Ukraine sanction. As you would guess, most of the West now sees Russia in somewhat of a less favorable light. But in China, actually, the, the people viewing Russia in a favorable light now uh, considerably increased with 66% positive and 23% negative. They improved from previous year 49% positive and 39 negative. So 
Um, it's interesting because there's a lot of uh, common geopolitical interests, a lot of common views on things in the world that differ quite a lot from the West. So yeah, we, we have big hopes for that trade relationship to, to improve and grow much further. It's it's very interesting what, what Martin just said there, uh, Pepe, because um, it, I have my impression is this Ukraine crisis is really a catalyst for much of what you've said. We've seen some trends over the years, over the last decade, but this is the real catalyst because sitting here in Moscow and looking at Brussels and what they have done with this coup in February is that Moscow simply doesn't trust the European Union anymore. You know why? Because they lie. They yeah. lie. They don't keep their exactly. word. And, and this is something very important here because they look east and they see partners, partners that um, are, are, are honest. They're, maybe it's a hard deal to get, but they keep their word. It's very important to do that. And this is one of the primary reasons I think the Russian political class is just saying enough is enough. You know, they said, you know, look at the Ukraine crisis. You know, Russia, uh, Ukraine, um, Russia should uh, not have such a uh, strong discount, you know, on, on, on gas going to Ukraine because it keeps them weak and all that. And, and then after the crisis, they say, or during the crisis, say, no, you should keep that subsidy there because we don't want to pay for it, okay? That's what it gets down to. They see the EU talking out of both sides of their mouth, and that's why turning to the east where you have partners that do what they say and say what they do. Uh, yes, it's, it's, that's is a very important point, Peter, because the disconnect between Brussels, I mean the EU machine, the EC, the European Commission machine, and NATO, with the overall population and some of the best intellectuals in, uh, in Europe is absolutely staggering. I was talking this past few days, I was lucky enough to talk to some you know, first-class intellectuals in Paris and in northern Italy, between Milan and Turin. And they all say the same thing. They are uh, disheartened, they are depressed, uh, they, know, they know about the disconnect, but they are marginalized because they do not follow the there is no alternative Maggie Thatcher style school of thinking, which predominates in Brussels. And the majority of the population, in fact, uh, the former middle classes, wealthy middle classes in Western Europe, they are disappearing. And they see it disappearing because of austerity. They, they see uh, the whole Ukrainian fiasco as a diversionary tactic because you have the media, the big newspapers in Western Europe and the TV uh, chains talking about Ukraine all the time, but they are ignoring the you know, three recession in five years problem, which is the number one European problem. There is no growth. And in fact, in, in terms of Italy, there, there is even negative growth in Italy nowadays. In terms of uh, unemployment of, uh, you know, among young people between 18 to 25, Italy is now more or less like Spain. It's practically 50% of the future generations with no prospect of a job because of the austerity. So, and when you compare this to the policies in Brussels and blindly, the blind following, the blind as I call them, uh, Brussels following uh, Washington, which does not have a policy apart from splitting up Eurasia and preventing this Eurasian integration, which will include Germany as the leader of Europe and both Russia and China. It's an absolute disaster, in fact. The Chinese, when they look at this, they keep, it's Deng Xiaoping to the limit. They keep keeping a low profile, striking deals all the time. They are going to interconnect China with Europe via Eurasia, very important, bypassing Ukraine. When you look at all the silk roads that they are being built by the Chinese, the via Siberia, via Central Asia, the Maritime Silk Road, they all bypass Ukraine. They don't count okay, because they know that Ukraine is expensive. They don't need that. And in terms of uh, 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 high-speed rail, telecom, and uh, communications, who, who needs Ukraine? Nobody. Not even <laughs> Europeans. And people in Brussels, they also know they don't need Ukraine, especially because they don't have the money to pay Ukraine's bills. Period. Okay, Martin, I, I think it's, it's really interesting because if you look at most Western media, their top stories, okay, you'll have uh, ISIS, you'll have Iraq, uh, you'll have Ukraine, um, you'll have uh, that guy in South Africa that 
probably killed his girlfriend, but they said he didn't. And you know, you just look at all the, <laughs> look at all those headlines there. And then I can see the, the the Chinese leadership saying, "Good, these people are really preoccupied, okay, as we go around the world making great deals, not much, making much of a fuss. Oh, not carrying a suitcase of values to force on people. No wonder people like dealing with the Chinese." Yeah, yeah, absolutely. People are often preoccupied with. Go ahead, oh, Martin. With other less important uh, stories, but I can can tell you that the Chinese, you know, have been very aware of what's going on around the world, and they have just quietly, you know, there's the saying, "Bide your time and hide your abilities." Uh, in in Chinese, I can't say it in Chinese though. Uh, <laughs> but basically, they have been living by there for quite some time. And while while people maybe you know in in other countries uh, occupied with this not so important. And news and other things. The Chinese have been building the economic power. I mean, this long-term planning were very, very efficiently. They have been also building up uh, the the globalization of the renminbi step by step. And I think with those recent developments uh, and and uh, Russia-China relations also rapidly developing, there there could be quite quite a big difference in terms of um, what, what's happening with the financial system. Uh, globally, and also currency buys, which, which is one thing I didn't mention before. The renminbi now is trading at a six-month high, looking yeah. very strong. And the euro, this, this, uh, the, the eurozone debt crisis, maybe back soon, is, is, re is relatively weak. So dollar has been strong. We, we think, though, uh, it may be quite temporary because ultimately they have still um, a si similar uh, problems as the eurozone in terms of the sovereign debt. You see, still see a very, very weak labor market, even if they increase interest rates, which, which everybody is talking about now. When is that going to happen? The problem with that is if you have very high debt and increased interest rates, that can exacerbate the debt crisis. So yep. our bet, again, even currency-wise, would be uh, on, on the renminbi rather than other bets. You know, you know, Pepe. You know, when looking from uh, Beijing yeah. to the West, it, it looks like you know, in the West, they're, they're all arguing over the seating order on the Titanic. <laughs> Look, and they are not talking about, uh, I would say, the financial nuclear bomb ahead. Uh, a few analysts, uh, I, I, I include myself among them, we've been talking about this for a while, which is the progressive end of the petrodollar. Progressive. Okay. It's going to take a long time, but the building blocks are already here. This means, among other things, uh, a, a parallel SWIFT payment system, which will be launched essentially by Russia and China and will include Iran. So we have two of the most important energy producers in the world and the number one consumer buying uh, and exchanging energy without the petrodollar. This is the major economic story in the next few years. All right, on that point, uh, on that point, we're going to have to end it, gentlemen. We've run out of time. Many thanks to my guests in Hong Kong and in London. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Crosstalk Rules. I love you.